Hi, everyone. It's Rabbi Joshua Hoffman, and welcome to all those joining me tonight on our next class, and actually our next class of Soul Mastery. So we've been teaching this for six weeks, and uh, we're going to be concluding this series of learning. Uh, for those who are really interested in Musar text and ideas, and would like to learn in a more intimate environment, which is the way that the text was intended to be explored and grappled with and practiced, uh, we, we are conducting a class uh, that is continuing on on Tuesday evenings. And if you're interested in that, you can contact me as you'll see when I post the text for tonight, my email address is there and please contact me to continue learning Musar. Um, along with that, as we're speaking, so tonight will be the last class of Soul Mastery uh, in two weeks. So next week will be Erev Shavuot and we'll be celebrating with uh, the holiday. And, um, and it'll be a great way for all of us to bring in this joyous occasion of receiving the Torah together with learning all across the city. Uh, the week following after that will be the first installment of the next series of classes, which we're calling Prayer Mastery. And that I think would be a most timely and worthwhile series of classes, especially because this summer is a time when we have a little bit more opportunity to focus on some learning, perhaps acquire some new skills. And this is a great way to take on one of those big, hairy, audacious goals, like knowing what to say and why we say it and when we say it, especially for the holidays as they're coming up at the end of the summer. And uh, however, we're going to be present in that space, whether it's back in our congregations or it's in our homes or it's just exclusively like we're doing right now throughout the, uh, the, the internet and through our Zoom connections, that whenever we do engage in prayer, the more understanding, the more literacy, not only language literacy, but idea literacy that we have with prayer, the more confident and confident we'll feel with these ideas, which are so important to us each and every day. So be on the lookout for that. That's in two weeks, same time, Tuesday nights, Soul Mastery. So glad that you're here with us tonight. I feel like a talk show host. And, uh, and I'm happy for us to study tonight's text, which is about emet. So emet in Hebrew means truth. And we're going to study some texts, uh, first from the rabbinic tradition, uh, really talking about a couple concepts that are, are uh, opposite in their understanding of what truth really means. And as you'll see, tonight is not only about kind of what is the truth or how to protect the truth, uh, or not even really to think about yourself and how to make sure that what you say is always something from a place of truth. Um, while that's always a goal, that's, that's not the ultimate goal here. The ultimate goal when you talk about truth is that your ability to sit from a place in what feels and knows to be true, you are knowing that it is true. That when you speak, and especially when you are communicating with others, that that truth is really what is being expressed. And there isn't any kind of distraction or self-intention that could complicate that interaction, which is so very important. So, so that's how we're going to study tonight. And I'm really glad that you're with us. And I welcome all my friends. I'm going to take a look at my Facebook, see if you're all there, because I know that some of you are coming on to join as well. And as that is happening, I am going to make sure that I can see you because I want to take your comments when we get to places to stop. And uh, there we go. How to make sure that what you say is see, it's in there. All right, here we go. Fantastic. Tonight, as we said, the subject is Emmet. And for those who have been learning with us for the past seven weeks, know that we have taken quite a journey through all of the virtues that have been communicated through, throughout the tradition and have been form, formalized in, in what is known as Musar practice. So we've studied things like orderliness, and we've studied things like separation. We've studied things like equanimity and patience and cleanliness or dignity, and we've uh, studied uh, concepts like, um, like um, silence, and we've studied uh, concepts like, um, like understand, uh, what's the other ones? They're all good. <laughs> and when we studied all of those different concepts, the idea that we're reaching this, this one, which I think is a pinnacle one, um, and one that actually is not only timely for the moment, but is actually really critical in the, the shift of, of your consciousness 
Uh, but it's not just about your behavior. And it's not just about the way that, that you perceive the world and, and attuning yourself to be able, able to respond to the world as it presents itself to you in a better way. But what it really is, is it's ultimately about communicating these higher values, these bigger ideas. That's the work that Musa really enables us to do. And I think that's what, when we, we get to the title of this, this isn't about being yourself, this is about being your soul. And I, wanted, um, I want you to keep that in mind. Talk about being yourself all the time. And Musar is really about being your soul. And tonight is a way that I think we can approach that. So let's get to the text for us to study tonight. So fascinating. It's not coming out here. So thank you for your patience. My technology, once again, has given us so many exciting distractions. There we go. Hopefully you're seeing this. Let me make sure we're on. Yeah. Okay, thanks for your patience. All right, good, here we go. Soul mastery, musar modernity, emmet, truth. Being yourself or being your soul. So the first text that we're gonna to study tonight is from the Talmud. And in particular, this text, which have, has been uh, taught in many different respects, it really does primarily deal with one of the great theological problems called theodicy, or how do you deal with the problem of evil? Um, if God is all good, then how can there be something that is not good? And really grapples with that. And here, as we read the text tonight, it's the same thing. If God is truth, and that is the sort of mandate of what we understand as God to be, then how can there be things that, that aren't true? Or how do we discern things that are true or not true? So in that text, this is one of the great rabbinic kind of insights, imaginations about how they deal with this thing called the Yetzer Hara, with this sort of evil inclination to distract people from truth and to um, persuade them to live a life based on lies which appear to them as truth. So it says, and they cried, as you're looking at the text with me, with a great loud voice unto the Lord their God. Okay, so who's the they? The they is B'nai Yisrael. The people are crying with a great voice unto God. They're praying with all their souls. They're lamenting. They're tearing out their hearts and their clothes and their, they are mourning. And presumably, what are they mourning for? They're mourning for the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem because that, at least historically, was the catastrophic moment that defined Judaism and its shift from its understanding of encounter with God through temple service to the more conventional understanding that we have today where we encounter God through text, we can encounter God through these things like midot, all of that. So what did they cry? The rabbis ask. Woe, 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 it is he who has destroyed the sanctuary, burnt the temple, killed all the righteous, driven all Israel into exile, and is still dancing around among us. So I, I included the notes here, right? Woe is he, who is he, the Yeser Hara, the tempter to idolatry, has destroyed the sanctuary. Now we know historically who destroyed the sanctuary? The Romans. The Romans came in, there was a fight against the Zealots, the Roman army was pressing upon the walls of Jerusalem. And we remember Yohanan ben Zakkai in that great story negotiates to be smuggled out of the temple precinct in order to set up the rabbinical court in Yavne. And the temple still is destroyed. The zealots who remain are killed as is the temple itself torn asunder. Okay, so they destroyed this, that what happened here is that they've shifted it and they said, it wasn't the Romans, it's he, the Yetzer Hara. Now we've studied in this class before, what's the Yetzer Hara? It's, it's an internal experience. What an incredible move, an incredible move to say that something external forces beyond our control. There is this feeling that perhaps this, this inclination, this impulsive behavior that we have within us can be controlled, but here's what happened when we left it uncontrolled. It destroyed the sanctuary, it burnt the temple, it killed the righteous people, it drove everybody into exile, 
And the worst is it is still dancing among us, right? It's not like the Yetzirah has finished his job and gone off to a nice vacation in Cabo San Lucas. No, the Yetzirah is unrelenting until every gesture of goodness is stamped out according to this text. You have surely given him to us so that we may receive reward through him, they say, right? Basically, this evil impulse is created for us so that we can eradicate it, so that we can be worthy of being in your presence by destroying it. We want neither him nor reward through him, okay? In other words, we don't think that the way that we're supposed to be in your presence, God, says these people who are lamenting the destruction of their temple and the way that they used to encounter with God, we don't want this evil impulse that will be conquered and enable us to, uh, to, to be in worthy of your presence again. We don't want that because we can't handle it. We don't want him and we don't want the reward. And then... This is the kicker and why it's introduced tonight. A tablet fell down from heaven for them, whereupon the word truth, emet, was inscribed. So the rabbis imagine that people are praying, the temple's destroyed, they don't want the evil impulse, they don't think that the way to kind of repair their damage that has been, been brought between them and God is by overcoming the evil impulse. They're saying, we've had it. We have no more energy. We are completely incapable of living up to this expectation, at which point the tablet falls from the sky and truth falls down. I want you to hold on that for a second and let's try to figure that out. Rabbi Chaimina said, one may learn there from this that the seal of the Holy One, the blessed be he, is truth. Okay, so from this first text, before we get any deeper, what we're learning is that truth is something that exists from kind of divine influence. There is such a thing, at least according in the mind of the rabbis, and I think even in our mind, of truth with a capital T, that there are things that exist in the world that are absolutely true. Whether you're a rationalist and it's about mathematics and it's about the pull of gravity or it's about the sort of um, contraction and expansion of the universe, or it's truth about human behavior and the sort of underlying thing that even in a great crisis like we find ourselves today, the truth is that human beings are as they always have been and will continue to be. And there's truth in that. Or maybe it's the truth of the sort of like existence of the world as it is, right? That the sun sets and the sun rises and the sun sets and time marches on. We live and we die. And these are the truths that exist in our world. There are things that do exist with a capital T in our life. The task is to identify those, to understand them, to become masters with them, and to be able to, to embrace them in such a way that they embody not yourself, not, not your own benefit, but they embody your understanding of what your soul's purpose truly is. What is the truth of your soul? This is the work that we have before us. And this text first says, look, we've been down that path and we thought that we were doing the right thing with offering the sacrifices because that's what you commanded us, God. But then that was destroyed and the evil impulse, which may have been the cause for us to do it, that evil impulse is the one that maybe caused the destruction itself. And if that's the case, that it was something that we did, we don't want any part of that. But the tablet falls from the sky and says, there's still more to learn. There's still more truth. So let's go back into our text. Any comments? I'm looking so far. Everybody's okay? Fantastic. So take a look now. Okay, here we go. I want you to take a look at the words on the screen in Hebrew. Just look at them. 
And when you look at the letters on the screen, you see an Aleph for those who can read, a Mem and a Taf. All you need to know at this point, even if you're not a Hebrew reader, is the shape of the letters. The shape of the letters, which make the word Emet, truth, are all on the same plane. They are level, okay? Sheker, which is the opposite of truth, at least for this purpose, means lie, truth and lie. Sheker, if you look at it, just the shape of the letters, they're all pointed. They all have the kuf, which is in the middle, is a singular line, and the resh is also a singular line. It totters. It isn't on a firm foundation. And then, as we read the text, this is a wonderful discovery and a wonderful teaching about truth, playing on the letters, but really revealing something very powerful about what truth is and what it might be and how to discern between what is truth and lie. That's what you need to do. All right. Before I start, I'm going to say um, good evening to my colleague in Flushing, New York, Rabbi Biller. Shalom. Um, oh. Of course, I thought it was a question. I'm so happy you're there and we will be in contact by all means, okay? And welcome to all my friends who are watching as well. Let's read this. This is from, this is actually found in many different places throughout the Talmud and the Midrashic literature. It's one of those like great famous lines. And if you haven't studied it, it's great to study it tonight. Why are the letters of the word Sheker or lie adjacent to one another in the alphabet while the letters Emet are distant from one another? So much so that actually Aleph, Mem, and Taf represent the first, middle, and last letters, near middle, and the last letters of the Hebrew Aleph bet. In other words, Sheker, if you know your Hebrew alpha, Aleph bet, right, it's Kuf, Shin, Resh. There are three letters right next to each other. And the word Sheker is a word that is created with the three letters right next to each other. And the word that we use for truth is from the beginning the middle and the end throughout consistent, okay? So it asks the question, why is that the case? Which, you know, <laughs> I always ask about why letters are the way that they are in their formation. Welcome to rabbinic teaching. It's the beauty that every single letter is worthy of, of understanding and has unique interpretation. This text is attributed to the great Rabbi Akiva who was so masterful in taking even these letters and making great meaning out of them. So look at what he says. He says, that is because while falsehood is easily found, meaning like shin, kuf, resh, they're right next to each other, right? And so if they're bunched together, it's easy to identify. Truth is found only with great difficulty. <sighs> Beautiful, right? Truth is not something that is just easily discernible. It's not like you open up the book and truth is right there. It's not the way that it works, even in the Torah. The Torah has truth, but it's not that you just look at the surface of the text and you understand its meaning and therefore that's the truth. If that were the case, we wouldn't have these layers and layers and layers of tradition that are continuing to emanate even in this generation, trying to find new and deeper understandings of what we come to qualify as God's word to us, the truth. And why do the letters that comprise the word Sheker all stand on one foot, right? If you look at them, they're all pointed, and singular, when the letters that comprise the word emet stand on bases that are wide like bricks, because the truth stands eternal and falsehood does not stand eternal. I want to give thanks to um, one of my teachers, Rabbi Gordon Tucker, who turned me on to a fantastic book that I'll introduce you to. I didn't bring the quote for tonight, but it's just important to sort of um, bring this into conversation. So um, a professor at, at Princeton University, I believe his name is uh, Harry Franklin, uh, wrote a book called, um, it's called On BS. And he um, expresses that word in its full meaning. And what he does in a very, he's like a, he's a moral philosopher. And what he does in, in his, uh, his short book, it's like 60, 80 pages, is he identifies what distinguishes truth and what distinguishes not a lie, but something that is, that is fabricated, maybe believable, but not, might not necessarily be the truth, right? And we call that BS, right? Something that a person believes so much so that they'll persuade you that it's the truth, even though once you kind of like 
scratch the surface and study a little bit deeper, it may not be the truth at all, right? Like just a classic example of this is how many times are you talking and somebody says, everyone is doing this. Everyone wants this. Could it really be possible that everyone is doing this and everyone wants this? I think what's trying to be said more clearly is that this is something that you want to pay attention to. And if you're wondering how other people are paying attention to it, then I'm going to tell you that everybody does, and that's going to persuade you to change your mind. So, um, so in this book, I'm talking about making the distinction between that. I think our first understanding of truth is not, it's not a book with answers, right? This isn't just a, it's not a geometry book or a, a calculus book or a book on physics. It's not just the answers. Truth is something that is hard sought. It's something that you have to grapple with and discern and peel away the layers of what is seemingly on the surface. And, and what truth is in this point, it's not answers, it's not facts. It's actually the interpretation. It's the, it's the experience of the truth that you have. That's what truth comes to be. And falsehood or a lie or BS or whatever you want to call it is precisely the exact opposite. One interesting distinction, right? A liar knows the truth and doesn't tell the truth. A person who speaks BS may or may not know the truth, but is telling you something that isn't the truth, that has a new truth for you, to persuade you not for the truth, but for themselves. And when you are trying to understand that distinction, about what lies do. When people usually lie, what are they lying to? They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to have somebody, somebody think lowly of them or, or to judge them or to punish them because people don't like that feeling. So they lie to try and cover up the potential of that happening. And BS is also kind of the similar sort of effect that you try to kind of cover up what may or may not be the truth because you're afraid that speaking that truth may not be as advantageous to you. But the truth, whenever you speak the truth, and you know this to be true for yourself, when you speak the truth, you don't have that concern. It doesn't, it doesn't plague you. It doesn't, it doesn't distract you. Truth is something that you speak from and you speak towards. It's something that you share. A lie is not something that you share. A lie is something that you hold on to, that you protect yourself from, or you use as a protection from, because the truth is something that you're not capable of bearing. So let me stop right there for a second, see if anybody had a comment. I'm going to do that. Thank you, Rebecca. I, will, I thought I made it bigger. I was 150%. I'm going even bigger. And hello to all my friends that have joined in tonight. It's so great to see you. Okay? So now let's go back into our text. One more rabbinic text, and then we'll go into the Musar text. This is a famous text, and if you haven't studied it, um, I really, really, really recommend you do so, and you do so with, um, with several mindsets. One is about sort of how we treat somebody who is um, interested in, in converting to Judaism. And the other one is you talk about the dignity of rabbinic wisdom and, and truth. Here's um, the way that I want us to look at it tonight. I want you to understand like why being a bearer of truth and sharing the truth is so important. The sages taught, there was an incident involving one Gentile who came before Shammai. Okay, so this is actually a series of these moments in which a non-Jewish person is interested in converting to Judaism and talks to the two great rabbis of the generation, Shammai and Hillel. Okay, so the Gentile, the person who was interested in coming, converting to Judaism, asks Shammai, how many Torahs do you have? Okay, he's not asking like, you know, how many are in your ark at Valley Beth Shalom? Right? It's, not, it's not a contest to see how more ornate your uh, Torahs are. He's asking, what, what, how many truths do you possess? So Shammai responds, two, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The Gentile said to him, with regard to the winter to written Torah, I believe you, right? 
the written Torah, you say, is directly from God. And I'm going to believe you, so says this person, that that written Torah is the true Torah. It's truth. But with regard to the oral Torah, I do not believe you. Right? You bunch of rabbis, you're humans, and you just interpret stuff, and that means nothing. Right? Convert me, says the Gentile, on condition that you will teach me only the written Torah. So Shammai scolded him and cast him out with reprimand. We can always ask that question about whether Shammai did the right thing or not. Depends on how you read this, and it depends on how you understand the next text, next part of the text. The same Gentile came before Hillel, okay? In other words, like mommy, daddy <laughs> didn't like what he wanted from daddy, so he decided to go to mommy. The same Gentile came before Hillel who converted him and began teaching him the Torah. On the first day, he showed him the letters of the alphabet and said to him, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalid. The next day, he reversed the order of the letters and told them that an olive is tough and so on. The convert said to him, but yesterday you did not tell me that. And Hillel said to him, you see that it is impossible to learn what is written without relying on an oral tradition. Don't you rely on me? Therefore, you should also rely on me with regard to the matter of the oral Torah and accept the interpretations that it contains. And all of us are softened by this. We're meant to read Hillel as the hero, even though we keep the tradition of Shammai for a reason. It could have just been that once upon a time, somebody came to Hillel and this is what Hillel did. But our rabbinic tradition holds Hillel and Shammai together not always as opposites, but perhaps dimensions of the same idea. There is a truth to Shammai, and there is a truth to Hillel. And the way that they approach them are slightly different. But the thing that makes this interesting is that Hillel did something that was extraordinary. Hillel understood that what the person needed to know, the truth of the person, was not something that that person could understand at that particular moment. And rather than lay down the law and say, this is the truth, accept it or else, Hillel says, come learn with me. And I'm going to show you why what you are thinking, your truth is not the truth that you carry. And in that moment, we understand a very, very powerful message of what truth is. Truth is not just about a sense of the right or wrong that there's a right and true and it exists on one line. But the truth is also a little bit about what Hillel does here. Hillel understands that he can't speak, he can't teach a person, he can't connect with a person unless that person is ready to connect with him in the truth that he has to share. Being a soul master is being able to acquire that kind of patience, humility, righteous action, equanimity, orderliness, separation, all of the virtues that we've been studying and why truth is, I think, it's not the apex, but it's, it, is, it is perhaps the most challenging and the most important of all of the midot. Because if you want to be a person of truth, you need all of these virtues in order to be able to apply the truth in the right context at the right time and with the right intention. So let me stop and I'll look that, uh, I'll look at any comments. Hello, my friend, Suzanne. Suzanne comments, she always thought that the reason we turn converts away is in order to pacify the governments who are anti-Semitic. That is a very interesting idea. I, um, and I'm surprised that that was your always thought. I, that is not necessarily the reason why we would um, dissuade someone from converting to Judaism. And if the thought was like Shammai, Shammai really was interested in converting this person, but wanted this person to kind of like go and discover the truth themselves. That may be one of the reasons why Shammai says what Shammai says, but I don't think it's because Shammai is concerned about a government, which I think is, you know, a really good point that that there's a concern about how the rest of the world perceives Jews, because we have said we are harbingers of truth. Remember the last text that we read, 
right? Remember that we don't want that temple, but truth falls out of the sky and the people pick it up, by the way. That's, that, that part's another piece of the text altogether. Truth is not something, even for, for Jews, that just falls out of the sky and we hold on to it. You see, it's something that's meant to be interpreted and applied and understood. That's what makes Judaism so vibrant, so delicious, so challenging, sometimes so enervating, because it seems like we're just looking for the right answers. And if we only had the right answers and we told the world what the right thing to do was, then everybody would listen. But the last part of Suzanne's comment is so important. There is this kind of like disdain, hatred, antipathy towards people who believe that they are carriers of truth because it would be much easier to live in a world in which truth was just simply mandated. So it would seem. But I've read and you've read every apocalyptic or what do you call it, dystopian novel when it seemed like there was absolute truth that everybody adhered to. There's something just kind of like crazy and wild and free in, in every human soul that says that there's something about truth that cannot be contained by any one code of laws. That's why in this text, and I think it's so wonderful that it was shared, that's why in this text, there are two Torah. There is a written Torah and an oral Torah, if you wanted to say generally. They're not opposite of each other. One has absolute deference and loyalty and respect for the other. So if you wanted to say that there was a core truth, that is the Torah, but it doesn't exist without the layers and the circles of understanding and, and interpretation that come as, as a result too. Thank you, wonderful comments. So let's go. I hope somebody said that they were mad. I hope that you're not mad. Okay. So now, now let's take a shift. This is now, oh, about 1800 years later, okay? And what it says is from uh, Menachem Mendel Leffen of Satanav, the Cheshman and Efesh, okay, which we said is an 18th century text, okay? He, um, he says this about truth. Do not allow anything to pass your lips that you are not certain is completely true. In other words, what the Cheshbon and Nefesh, the one who teaches the accounting of the soul, that when you're doing the soul accounting of truth and you're trying to embody truth, his wisdom is don't allow anything to pass your lips that you're not certain is completely true. You might want to pick up on certainty and you might think that, wow, that is a very heavy load to bear. And I'm not ever certain of anything. Okay and completely true, well, wait a minute, what about like, you know, maybe twisting the truth a little bit, it's mostly true, and no, no harm is being done in the mostly true thing, isn't that also possible? So the expectation that you say for yourself, do not allow anything to pass your lips that you are not certain is completely true, requires not only like a little bit of mental focus, not only a little bit of emotional preparation, but also a sense of soul connection, a sense of like transcendent understanding that what's about to transpire, that the truth as however it is that you've determined is about to be expressed, that what makes it completely true is that it's encounter with the other or with the world, however it is manifest, is the most authentic expression that you could offer at that particular moment. So let's study a little bit further. This is Rabbi Aristone, who we've been studying from uh, throughout this class so far. And let us read what he has to say for us. In working on the Midah of Emet, we must be truthful with ourselves. We must be truthful whether people are watching or not. We should not lie to ourselves about who we are. We should not portray ourselves as someone we are not, claiming qualities for ourselves that we do not in reality possess. Instead, we must act out of integrity. We must be consistent in what we say and how we feel. We are not to say one thing while thinking something else in our hearts. Whew. Truthfulness is important in relationships, whether with strangers or acquaintances or with close friends and family. We need to avoid falseness 
be it in business encounters or in promises to loved ones. To avoid creating hurt or humiliation from stark and blatant honesty, we can soften the truth as long as that softening is defensible. Softening truths should not become so habitual that we are in danger of slipping into patterns of outright lying, right? Like how many times do you tell somebody that they look great when they really don't? That might be outright lying and that might not benefit the person that you love or benefit your soul. Since God is emet, acting out of B'Tselem Elohim, or out of being in the image of God, we too must be truthful before God. If we're looking to be in the presence, whatever presence that we call God, it's um, as, as we defined it. And then you can even define it as the other, as Rabbi Aristotle says, the other extended infinitely. It is the, the concept of the other. It is even beyond the concept. It is the absolute other with a capital O. If that's your understanding of God, or if your understanding of God is more personal, and that really does speak about the honesty that you have in your soul and, and is um, critical of, of your behavior if you're not being authentic of that. Either way that you conceive of that and somewhere along the spectrum or nowhere at all, you get to this idea that being in the presence is truly not only about your best self, but it's your best soul. And so being truthful enables you to enter into that space. And sometimes softening the truth, at least as the rabbi writes, enables us to do that effectively, authentically, okay? The other part is, I don't know if you saw this, but I'll just sort of bring it up, right? Portraying ourselves as someone we are not. We can spend an hour just talking about that. We've discussed this before, the masks that we wear. You know, we're living in a time when we're literally wearing masks as we're going out into the streets and into emerging into commerce. It's even funny when sometimes somebody puts it on in the uh, safety and the comfort of their own home while they're talking to somebody on the Zoom screen. Okay, that probably doesn't happen except for a joke, but you understand that we're wearing, wearing masks that don't have physical materiality, but they actually are masks of portraying ourselves. And the challenge that we have is that we want to portray ourselves as authentically possible as we can, even though sometimes doing that might put us in jeopardy, make us vulnerable. So we have to learn how to strengthen ourselves in such a way so that when we do that, not only do we feel like what we're saying and we're certain is completely true, but also that we're saying it with all the other qualities that we studied before. So let me just do a little bit more of Stone and then we'll take a break. Okay. The individual integrity of ourselves refers to a plural unity consisting of a Yetzer Hara and a Yetzer Hatov, a place for the self and a place for the other. Truth is a statement that serves the other while falsehood serves the self. I love that line. How do you know that something is true? When it's serving the other. How do you know that something is false? When it serves the self. That's true inside of you. That's true if you can discern it in other people and, uh, and learning how to mitigate that when sometimes you're in the presence of somebody who isn't speaking truth and you need to respond to that truthfully or vice versa, right? That you feel like you want to speak truth, but you can't because the other person can't hear it. Just like in the Hillel example, you have to be careful that what Hillel didn't do in that example is he didn't lie. He didn't say, okay, there's only one Torah. Actually, it just says in the text, Hillel took the convert immediately. So this is what you want. This is, this is what it is. Okay. And then taught him the truth that, uh, that he was just waiting to discover. When we frame the Midah this way, we can negotiate the difficulties that arise when we try to distinguish people between what we call factual truth and what we call practical truth. I love that, right? There's facts. Boy, are we good with a lot of facts. And in the 21st century, we have more facts flying at us through these screens and all over the place. And boy, do we also have a lot of things that are challenging that truth. And what makes this subject so incredibly important to discuss is that there is an assault on truth. There is a question of who owns truth. And we're hearing it through news screens and we're hearing it in all kinds of reports from people who are speaking not just about this present moment in the pandemic,
but the entire political universe, the entire global, the global moment is a one that is challenged with an authenticity with truth. That somehow we've kind of become accustomed to the idea of like manipulating the truth a little bit here or trying to understand the truth a little bit differently that somehow that will gain us an advantage of the moment and that that advantage is good enough. But what we're finding is that in this moment, in this particular moment in history, that manipulation of truth is causing us great harm. It's, it's a detriment to us. It's a detriment to our souls. So this idea that truth is something that serves the other and falsehood serves the self and trying to, trying to mitigate that in a world where we're hearing so much of this like almost truth. And I had a perfect example this morning. I, I had that everyone is buying this thing. And I thought, ooh, I don't have that thing. Maybe I need to do that too because everyone is doing it. Of course, you know, I didn't think just a half a step back and say, wait a minute, if everybody's doing it, then I would have already done it. <sighs> All right, forget that crazy, crazy thinking. Instead, I'm going to just recognize that when something like everything or everyone say something, it can't always be true. And if there is a little bit of truth to be found in there, then it's important that we make that connection. That's the difference between factual truth and practical truth. Okay, so a little bit more of, um, of Rabbi Aristotle, two more paragraphs. Factual truth is a report that we make of what we believe is actually the case. Most of the time, we are obligated to be faithful to this factual truth because speech, both verbal and nonverbal, is the primary way that we engage with the world. We are also required to engage in a way that our speech does no harm. Okay, just think of the doctors in that moment. Generally, we understand this requirement to be reflected in telling the factual truth in our speech. This general approach, however, does not meet all circumstances. Sometimes it's not clear that the factual truth can cause unnecessary pain to the other, even when not affording any protection to the self. <sighs> Let me just read that again. Sometimes it is not clear that factual truth, right? Something demonstrable, something that you can look up in a book and say two plus two equals four, can cause unnecessary pain to the other, even when not affording any protection to the self. Okay? Those are things that like, you know, hey, maybe you're telling somebody that you know that they're overweight. Well, doing that would cause them a lot of pain. And that pain is not only pain that you cause the other person, but it might be pain that you incur because you've hurt them. So it might not be the right thing to just be like, you know, saying what's on the top of your mind. It's okay to be truthful, but to say what's on top of your mind and to be certain that that's truthful is actually a diminishment of this sense of truth. It may be factually true, but practical truth, the truth that we're talking about that mediates between us, that connects us to others, and that ultimately connects us to the other, well, that's a lot more practical truth. And that's why we have to have conversations like this. This is exemplified, so he concludes, by the well-known rabbinic exhortation that we are required to praise the beauty of every bride. For those who've been studying with me all the uh, seven weeks that we've gone through the classes, you notice that the very first text we studied was about these brides. And I love this text. It's an important text, right? So the, the question that's asked in the Talmud, I'll just bring it up for the moment and then, and then try to analyze why, why Rabbi Stone is concluding there. The story in the Talmud is, how does one greet the bride? And again, Hillel and Shammai say, or actually the rabbis, some of the rabbis, it's a, it's a rabbinic one. Rabbis say, um, the bride as she is, okay? And then the other rabbis come and say, no, 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 beautiful and graceful bride. And it doesn't matter what her physical appearance is because the truth is, the truth of the moment is she is a bride. That's the truth. And the truth of that moment is that the most precious moment is when two loving souls connect, okay? And that connection is something that is worthy of blessing. To be distracted by the way that somebody has appeared, appears in that moment. Why, that might be factually true, I suppose, in some book somewhere, 
But that's irrelevant because the practical truth is that that person, that soul, is a loving soul that is connecting to another loving soul. That's what I think Rabbi Stone is trying to get to, what truth is trying to teach us up until this moment. So when it says from the beginning of the text, don't speak unless you are completely certain, certain that you are completely true. You can speak from a place of practical truth. And it may not have factual truths as a part of it. Because the truth behind it is the idea of connection. The truth is that when you connect with somebody else that you love, and I hope that your love is so abounding and great that you can love many others, but not only the people that are closest to you, but also your circle of friends and community. And even if you are so courageous to share that love with the entire world, even when it doesn't reveal its truth to you, and even to that other truth extended infinitely, that that kind of truth connection is not something based on facts. Facts may be a part of it, may not be a part of it, but the practical connection is what it's precisely about. This midah is about being a master of that. Thank you for those commenting. Anybody else wants to comment questions or additions, feel free to post those into the chat box in our, um, on the Facebook page. And we're gonna continue with a little bit more of the text. Okay, now we're gonna to go to what would you do? So for those who have been learning all along with us and I welcome my new friends, what we do at this point for the last few minutes, we have about uh, 10 minutes left, it looks like. For the last few minutes, we are um, going to explore this concept of, here we go, it looks paused. There we go, ah, um, applying this in real life. And in order to apply this in real life, you kind of need to do a little bit of internalization. So what I'd like for you to do is I'd like you, if you're comfortable, close your eyes, take a few deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth if you can, if you've got enough airflow through your nose and through your mouth. Put your hands on your knees if you're comfortable, close your eyes if you're comfortable, you don't have to, I don't see you. And since you're looking at the screen, nobody else is seeing you. But if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes, perhaps even all the more so. And breathe in through the nose. Slowly out through the mouth. Already you feel a little bit of relaxation in your body and as you breathe in again. You begin to see that your thoughts, maybe they're just focusing on my voice or focusing on the screen rattling or focusing on the animals in the background or something else, focusing on the surroundings. That's okay, take a deep breath in. And now through the mouth. Take a little bit more focus and this time on yourself. Feel your body, feel its situation. Hopefully you're relaxed. You feel the blood flow through your body. Maybe your heart rate slow down that you've been breathing a little bit more deeply. And I want you to think about all these ideas of truth that have been shared. What is your truth? What is your truth? How do you know that you are speaking and acting from your truth? Take a deep breath and exhale. The moments that you know that you are speaking and acting from your truth, those are times when you're calm, you're collected, conveying the truth is something that is expressed with a gesture of love. No anger, no certitude, no self-righteousness because yourself is not in the truth about. Where are you when those moments happen? Hold on to that. Um, I see Stuart's comment, and it's so great to see you, Stuart. I mean, really, it's so great to see you. And I will make a comment about your question after we do this exercise, okay? What would you do? So let's read. When the team meeting began, 
Larry's department head, Wendy, informed everyone of a new project that their section was to undertake. The team was told that the CEO had accepted $3 million from a foundation to institute an educational program in a number of schools across the country over the next three years. As Larry understood, it, the educational program involved lectures and demonstrations rather than active learning for which the organization advocated and in which it was actively involved. Wendy put up sheets of charts, paper, and with marker in hand asked the group to begin to brainstorm how to implement this new program, lectures and demonstrations. Larry immediately launched into the question of why the organization was taking on a project whose principles seemed to run counter to what the organization was doing overall. Wendy kept trying to refocus the conversation on the assignment that they had been given by the CEO. Larry was having none of it, however. In the end, he relented and quit interrupting. The group went on to outline some strategies to support the project. He did not participate. Okay, so if you're with me and as you finish reading this, what would you do? Go ahead and put it in the chat box. I would love to see what you have to say. What would you do? So the story is, right, we have a guy who's sitting in a team meeting and the very mission of the organization is shifting as this $3 million grant is coming in. So it's great to have a $3 million grant. How exciting, right? And especially in these times of economic uncertainty, anybody with $3 million to put towards educational programs should be thrilled by the idea. But Larry is frustrated because it's not the truth or the purpose of the organization. So he interrupts and he corrects and he tries to refocus and he's trying to understand. And he just doesn't understand. And you can imagine that he's getting a little frustrated in this moment, so much so that at the end, he just stops, right? He doesn't yell, doesn't get angry. He just stops, right? He removes himself. But then what happens is, as you hear the conversation keeps on going, he doesn't participate. So obviously this is an example of like, maybe we could have done it better. If he had been practicing the midah of truth, what would it have been? Is it simply the midah of factual truth that he would have been practicing? Was it really important that Larry got up? I mean, this is one possible example. And he said, look, I need you all to know the truth of what our organization is. And this $3 million grant, no matter how generous it is, and no matter how important it is, this is anti to the very foundation of what we exist to be. He could have said that, right? He didn't say it. He tried to like, you know, ask a bunch of questions and manipulate the moment. Or he could have understood a little bit of the practical truth, right? The practical truth is that the leader of the organization for whom he was an employee, right? He wasn't the chief. He was just a wonderful participant, a team partner. He might have even been a really important team partner. But at that moment, the CEO had given the sort of directive for them to strategize and organize. What was the truth of the moment? Was the truth of the moment staying true to the mission? Was the truth of the moment that maybe the goal was education? And if you were to say that education only exists for, by active engagement, I mean, chas for shalom. God forbid it should be that true because here we are, we're not really in a give and take class. I mean, you're writing in the, the comment box, which I love, but the reality is it's just me talking to you and I really hope you enjoy me talking to you because I don't hear you in response. That's certainly one way for us to learn, right? But then this, and this act of learning is also not necessarily always have to be the other way to learn, right? That the other way to learn is like through interaction and twisting and, and challenging and pushing and pulling and all of that. That's another way of looking at it. But here, here's a moment where maybe this organization is going into different avenues because the ultimate goal, like the story of the bride, right, is that it's not how it looks, right? But it's the idea that, that education in its purest form is a truth that is conveyed from one to many, one to another. It's the process, it's the toolbox by which we convey truth, right? It might have factual properties to it. But the real truth is in the exchange. That's the thing about truth. The real truth is as much as it is about the thing on the page, I don't want to diminish that. It's even more important that the exchange is delivered with the same intent. That's something that this kind of practice helps us 
to understand deeply. How many times has somebody given you an answer that you knew was right, but it was given in such a way that it really kind of hurt your feelings or separated you from them? You know, they might be right, but A, they're not going to be your friend afterwards. B, you're going to be less likely to listen to them in the future. C, it's going to be like a truth that maybe feels a little bit punitive. So you might fulfill it, whatever it is, a responsibility or reaction to it, but it might not be a truth that you internalize. The best kinds of truth are the ones that are exchanged between us and the ones that in the exchange between us, I'm changed and you're changed and between us, we're changed together. That kind of work is what this truth is all about. So um, I'm going to go back just very quickly to my good friend, Stuart. Right? Could you give me, I'm going to give you another example of softening the truth. Okay. Um, so some people are, are very good at this um, because it's, it's, like, it's like Hillel. Right? Some people have an intuition and an ability to understand that what people are really understanding or, or are looking for is a truth about connection, validation, understanding, you know, perhaps we could, you know, bring out the bucket list of, of psychological needs that, that we have. And when we identify with those in concept, then, um, then the way that we communicate with another person is a way that we, we want to, we want to present what seems to be a factual need, right? So like, take, for example, you have somebody who's, um, Somebody whose who's phone usage or internet behavior is kind of beyond, beyond what, what is sort of reasonable and healthy, right? It's so much so that a person is like constantly online. And like when they're taking a break, they're going online. And when they go to sleep, you know, they've got the phone with the blue light on. And when they wake up, the first thing they do and becoming totally obsessed with that isn't healthy. Okay. It wasn't designed to be that way, even though our brains are like completely stimulated by it. And then giving us just tons and tons of positive feedback about all of the things that we're getting through all of this connectivity. And when you see someone who is kind of like, you know, connecting with that, softening the truth may not be directly coming and saying, you're using too much technology. But maybe, you know, uh, it's like subtlety, I guess, or like presenting perspectives. Um, or inviting opportunities that, that help bring a person away from perhaps their attachment to those things, right? And that's something that like, I, I think, you know, it depends on the situation. It could be a lot of work to, to try to really connect on, on something as really difficult as that. It may take a few passes to sort of reach to somebody like that. You know, you might invite somebody out for a walk and they're like, ah, I don't want to walk, right? Or let's go to like, you know, get some ice cream. I don't want to do that, right? Whatever it is, right? Sometimes the invitation of distraction isn't necessarily the thing that the person wants and you have to find the right time and the right place to do that. And I think that that's a very key point too, is that subtlety in the right time and the right place is, is about sensitively understanding when people can hear exactly what they need to hear. And some people are like innately good at this and some people need some practice and it's worth practicing because the ultimate goal is this concept of truth. So um, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for all your comments before we get to the concluding part. Joy, I love learning with you. And I just, I can't wait for you to uh, keep playing some beautiful music for, for us in our loving community. Um, Linda writes, possibly the mission of the company could shift to incorporate the money and develop the education, whoop, educational program. It's not giving me the rest of it. Give me a second. That would, there we go. That, there it's coming. That would be valuable to the students. It would soften the truth, right? Exactly, right? Maybe what, what could have happened, it's beautiful, right? So we, we looked at Wendy and we said, maybe, you know, maybe Wendy could have practiced a little bit of truth telling, right? Because she was clearly the sort of team manager. And maybe she could have softened the truth a little bit by saying, look, this is, you know, this is an education program that's, that may not be part of the 
sort of mandate of the company, but we're expanding that. So, so there's a little bit of explanation that can be a part of that. Um, and let's see. Uh, Joy, did, I love the things. Thank you. I hope everybody read Joy's comments. They're beautiful. Stuart says, I understand that. Thank you. My question arose because the text warned me to be careful not to get in the habit of lying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right? So, um, right? So, like, if you're constantly a person, beautiful, right? If you're constantly a person that is um, not telling the truth because you think people are going to be hurt by it, well, then you, you begin to develop, you know, certain qualities that diminish your authenticity, right? You're, you become so overly concerned about the well-being of another, the, the pain that you might cause from another, um, that you, you really kind of develop this, you know, this, this way of being, this, this uh, personality. That's not healthy either. So I think it's, re it's a really important balance, right? And the idea of not getting in the habit of lying is, is a way of saying that, you know, first of all, I mean, I think you're, let's, let's say it the other way, right? If you're always a person that believes that they're always right and they always have the truth, you're going to have a very hard time with this Mida because what I think this teaches us is that truth is not something that a singular human entity possesses all alone. Truth is something that is proven through connection. And it's proven through connection when it feels authentic from the way that you're expressing it and it is re received authentically from the, the other who is hearing it. And that is also true for communities and for the world. And if you wanted to get to the level of God or what we call God, that authentic connection with the other with a capital O. That's the kind of work that we're aiming towards. And if you're constantly qualifying yourself or you're getting into this practice of, of like not telling whole truths because you don't want to hurt people's feelings, well, then you're really sort of not being an authentic part of yourself. And I think, um, yeah, yeah, I, I hope I... I, I hope I got it right. And I'm sorry that we're, you know, we're working on it. Stuart says the way I presented softening didn't include any lying. Right? Exactly. I don't, I don't think that softening is lying. I think that actually, you know, it's, it's again, like you want to be a person of truth. So that means that you have to be like, like the Heshbon and Nefesh, the like Menachem Mendel Leffen of Satnaf says, don't speak unless you are certain you can be completely true. And that means if you have to um, kind of like speak to somebody about something that they're experiencing in a way or, or that they appear, how they appear or how they behave in a way that detracts from their ability to hear that truth, then you might want to soften something that's, that you speak to them that is truthful, right? So like, you know, the bride in the bride example, right? If the bride has got like, you know, a couple errant hairs on a b otherwise bald head and, you know, a mole with some hair sticking out and some teeth that are misaligned, right? You, you could say with some level of objectivity, although I'm not sure that that's necessary to say that, that that person doesn't appear to you as truth, truly beautiful. But if you're only looking at that level and you're not looking at the deeper level, the conceptual level, the soul level, and you're seeing that that soul is in connection, then you're then what you have to say to that person, if you're saying that like, gee, you're not a beautiful bride, then you're, you're, you're not speaking truth. But if you're saying to that person, what a beautiful bride you are, because I see your soul radiating in the world. That's the example that I think we're talking about in truth. And I hope that that's good. Thank you. Thank you for testing. I mean, I, I really appreciate it. And we are really great. And I really love that you've asked the questions. So look, it's, it's almost eight o'clock or it's actually a little bit after eight. Let me conclude with a couple of things. How do you live this, right? So there's all kinds of things. And as we've talked about, if you really want to learn this, like you can't just sit in a lecture and hear it. You got to practice it. If you want to practice it, give me an email and come and join the class. We got a great class. Next one is starting, I believe, July 9th. Okay. In the meantime, or along the way, if you're interested, here's one thing that Judaism has to say for you, okay? Do you, you recite verses, okay? This is sort of part of the Rabbi Stone Musar model, okay? Something that lets you, when you're in a moment, when you're not certain about the truth that you feel needs to be expressed, whether it's truthful, whether it's practically true, whether it's factually true, whatever, right? 
that you are uncertain about that. Verses that can come from the tradition can remind you of that, right? There are meditations, there's apps for this, right? There's great mindful, like you need somebody to like whisper in your ear, the little like, you know, Jiminy Cricket that says, you can do it, right? This is a way for you to carry a couple of those verses with you. So I'll leave you with these because they're great, okay? So this is from the book of Proverbs. Do not let truth and loving kindness leave you, right? So in other words, if you're in a moment of uncertainty and your goal is truth, and you're feeling it slip away, and that's part of the uncertainty, bring it back and let truth and loving kindness be with you. Probably that loving kindness and truth are going to be holding each other hand in hand. You would say, my mouth will speak truth, right? In other words, I have control over what happens here most of the time, okay? Practice, and practice makes us better. My mouth will speak truth. And the more that you practice that, the more that it's uh, possible for that to be true as well. Speak the truth to your neighbor. <sighs> Man, what a good thing to hold on to, okay? It's hard, hard, hard not to speak the truth because we, of those masks. We don't wanna be rejected. We don't wanna be judged. We don't wanna be punished. We don't want people to not love us. We wanna be loved. That's, that's part of our human makeup. Right? And sometimes the truth that's in us is a, is a conflicting truth with our best selves and, and our higher selves and, and the impulsive selves. And all of us that are on this journey, and I hope that you've enjoyed the journey learning with me, all of us that are on this journey and have enjoyed learning a little bit of Musar, a little taste of Musar, and are interested in learning more and are willing to go down the journey further and to continue practicing this, then I hope that what you've taken along the way is that this isn't about perfection. This isn't about being a better human being. It's about being a better soul. About being a better soul and becoming a master of your soul doesn't mean that you're always right. Doesn't mean that mistakes don't happen. Doesn't mean that impulses don't exist in you. Doesn't mean that sometimes you're conflicted and your emotions are more powerful than your intellect or that both motions or intellect separate you from this like higher transcendent part of yourself. Any one of those things are true when you are practicing to be a soul master. And what it means is that you find yourself in as an individual continuing to learn and you find yourself with a circle of people that are willing to embrace you on that journey wherever you're at. And that's something very important. And I hope that you find that in your journeys throughout the, the days. And I hope that you continue to learn with us at Valley Beth Shalom. And uh, I really am grateful that you're here to join me uh, for this Thursday evening time. And I hope that if dinner time is on the horizon, that you eat a beautiful dinner. And I hope that, uh, that if you're done with dinner and now it's an evening, that maybe you take some time off that screen since we talked about that and go for a nice walk. Have a great evening. Thanks for learning. Take care.